Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash cubsoutloud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Halloween Eve, Eve, 2023. I'm Jeff. Uh, Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. Everybody dance now! Wow, that was a throwback. And uh, that <laughs> makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast, Adventure Terminal Length, episode number 717. And how's that for a per- perfect intro? Especially considering in our upper left, we have the Dr. Edward Angelini Cook. Yay! Okay. Can't remember. Hi, everyone. I have to look to, you know, Hi. Pretty bunchy mess. How are you? Uh, ladies and gents, it's one of those uh, episodes where the good doctor has joined us again, so it must mean only one thing. Gary, what is that? That we invited him back. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, so it's landscape of relationships time. So everybody, mm-hmm. grab your favorite beverage, put your feet up, recline. Uh, we should get a theme song for this. What kind of a theme song is there for like a therapy session? I mean, really. I mean, the only one, the only thing that immediately comes to mind is the random sounds that came from like Dr. Katz, professional therapist, that show that started their series. But that's going to take a minute. So, well, we do. Isn't there like, isn't there like a Lady Gaga song? Huh? Maybe. Hmm. I, I am not familiar with her entire catalog. So, but you know what? We do learn a lot from this. So maybe this. Oh, that is true. Mm, okay. Also, sure. that's what I have on hand. So, <laughs> if anybody Don't has any better that. suggestions, please. Yeah, leave it in the comments. No, that's fair. And that's don't forget totally to like, comment, and subscribe, and ding that bell. Ding. All right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, like Edward's with us because. Um, Ed, do you even remember? I'd have to go look. Damn, I'm not prepared. Uh, we had this conversation. I said something came up recently, and yeah. um, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. What was it? Uh, oh, I know what it was. We were talking about Bluey, we were <laughs> so Bluey for those that don't know is an animated show that's based uh, in Australia. Um, It's very popular with a lot of different audiences. Um, So according to Wikipedia, really quick, uh, it's an anthropomorphic 60-year-old blue healer puppy who is characterized by her abundance of energy, imagination, and curiosity. It is very popular in certain circles, and I happened to be at a furry gathering, um, and so they were watching Bluey and talking about it, and uh, so it was interesting, and I had said to to Ed, in the midst of a conversation, I said that I was at this thing, and that it was an interesting cultural creation um, mm-hmm. that people enjoy, and I had said, I wonder if people are attracted to this show because of a lack of parental upbringing from the 80s through today. 
Um, Mm -hmm. In fact, it was funny because the person I was staying with, I had made comment about this and um, I mentioned about latchkey kids and they Mm. were like, what is a latchkey kid? And I was like, you don't know what a latchkey kid is? And we're not far apart in age. I was like, that was our generation. And so I looked up the definition and described it and they're like, oh yeah, I was one of those. (laughs) <laughs> which was really kind of funny. So um, the thing of it was, is that we, uh, you know, had this interesting conversation. So just so that people are aware of um, latchkey kids were kind of known as those that didn't have supervision when they got home from school because their parents were usually away and working. Um, so you had your own uh key basically to get into your home and you kind of supervised yourself for a period of time um, until your parents came home. There's a, there's a lot more of the history behind that, but what's that Jeff? God forbid that that happens nowadays. Well, no, I think it happens. Like, I think now it's more of a norm, like at a certain age that, you know, with things being the way they are. So that being said, I had, I had basically kind of said to Ed, I was like, um, I, I wonder if that's a thing about us, like trying to get fulfillment as adults related to why the po- this show happens to be so popular that like we've become an adult, we're on our own, we're doing our own thing. And this, this doesn't have a nostalgia factor to it. Uh-huh. Um, so, and then Ed and I uh, kind of talked and then it turned into today's topic, which is healing our queer inner child. Mm-hmm. Is that supposed to be a pun um, because he's a blue? He- she's a blue healer. So um, the family name is no. Healer, and the um, the mom's um, oh crap the the mom's maiden name is hold on I did I did research oh okay um, Healer and Fetch I think it's Fetch um, that's so Fetch. Uh, Bluey. I don't think we could make that happen. Her, her name is ah, uh, Healer. Um, cattle, cattle. So it's different kind of dogs. Okay. Um. So. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So the the topic of blue. So I actually watched Bluey for the first time about a month ago, and. After hearing about, you know, people who are like, why, <laughs> why am I watching this show more than my kids are? Right, um, right. And like, you know, I was like, yeah, I totally, I totally get it. And it had me thinking about um, the process of like the therapeutic process of, of inner child work. So when, when Gary brought that up, uh, I was like, oh, what, a, you know, we're talking about relationships, right? And our relationship with ourselves is within that umbrella, that landscape. Um, And I think that this is something that um, is a little bit of a cultural phenomenon right now. Um, Mm. So what a better time to talk about it. But this is not unique, right? These are not like, these are things that we have been doing for a really long time. So when it comes to like inner child work, um, Carl uh, Jung uh, apparently is the first one to like coin that term and and basically, it's um, we're talking about the like meta- metaphysical or like what I call like the self state um, parts of ourself that um, include our younger self um, that is still active inside of us and still is trying to process and interact with their thoughts or feelings or memories and um, uh, and but then also that's where our creative, our playful, our spontaneous um, side resides. So um, there's this really great book. I don't know the name of it, but it's it's a workbook that um, I like to use with clients, and it's about healing your inner child. And it goes through. Um, do you know uh, Dr. Eric Erickson? That name so Does right. that name ring a bell? It Baby. rings a bell, but I don't know. It is offhand. So if you've ever taken a psychology class, um, uh, he's one of the, um, you know, the stage models of development. So you'll hear of Erickson's um, eight stages of, um, of development uh, and that go through from uh, infancy all the way up until death. Um, and that there are these like um, 
uh, value complex or identity complex that we have to over over we have to complete in order to go to the next stage. Mm. And if we don't, then we're going to have something from uh, there's going to be an unmet need, right? So, um, what I really like about this book is it um, is it goes through healing all of the different parts of us from infancy all the way up to even adulthood and the the unmet needs that we may have and the so the way I formulate that is within us at any time, there are different versions of us. There's the, the infant part of us. There's the toddler part of us. There's the, um, you know, the, the five-year-old part of us. Right. Um, and they all have these needs that uh, whether are met or unmet um, are, are showing up um, when things happen today that remind us of that time. Uh, we may be, and the, that may be conscious or unconscious, um, but, you know, it's important for us to be aware of that. Um, and I think the therapy community likes to just kind of wrap that up as, as inner child, right? Um, mm. So, uh, so that's kind of inner child work, right? And that is, that's something that a lot of therapists uh, do. I do that work with clients and, um, and it's work that I engage in myself, Um but what's really helpful is that um, there are parts of us that, you know, because we're not perfect, right? Our parents weren't perfect. Our caregivers weren't. Our teachers, you know, all the different people weren't perfect, right? And we're going to have unmet needs throughout our, throughout our life. And um, what I really like about this work is we're giving ourselves the skills and the tools to reparent, ourself um so that that can help uh you know somebody who possibly has an anxiety um disorder or um or some kind of like attachment disorder um whether that be uh like an, uh, an anxious attachment or avoidant um or you know disorganized um it can help it can help ground us after some trauma that we've had um so the inner child work has a lot of really beneficial um, applications for it when it comes to therapy. What I will say, though, is I want to give a caveat that this is not therapy, right? So, like, one of the things <laughs> that I'm going to say is I'm going to give the recommendation, right? If this, if this is something that sounds sexy to you, that sounds really interesting, I would highly recommend um, contact, you know, talk if you have a therapist, talking to your therapist about it or, you know, engage – with a therapist, because this is something that, you know, you may need that you may need help with exploring. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, this isn't necessarily therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is just information. This is just information being passed along while um, Dr. Angelini Cook is a licensed therapist. He is not your, your, your therapist. therapist. Um, nor is it he sounds any like we're quoting. Ours. It almost sounds like David and I are quoting the same YouTuber who <laughs> I, I have watched that is a lawyer, and yeah. they are great because in the beginning they're like, "I am reviewing things, and I and I am not to be construed as giving legal advice because while I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer." Which I think is hysterical that they like just spell that out at the beginning of their videos because yeah. they're basically like, "That's not it." Like they're trying to say that's not how this works. Yeah, and that's I think yeah. how this this sort of situation works. I know I agree, I agree with you, Ed, in regards to like speaking on it, giving the information, and like, hey, if this is like digging some bells or making you feel some things, you might consider getting um, actually really, and I'll just say this: anything that we've talked about in our landscape of relationship series, um, yeah. if there are things in these series that are like digging bells or like fireworks are going off or whatever you want to call it, like, please, um, seek, um, therapeutic help. Um, this is, from this is an, an informational podcast, not, a, not a therapy session. There's right. very different things. Exactly. But, um, like oftentimes what I will tell people and I have people reach out to me and ask if, um, if I can help them find somebody. And that is definitely something I'm, I'm, more than happy to do so regard so like depending on where you are i can help connect you with possibly a therapist that is that would be in line with what your needs are for therapy um 
it may take me a couple you know days to get back to you but please reach out to me um i'm definitely here to help connect people to the people that will help them Mm -hmm. um so uh to what uh gary was talking about um so bluey's really interesting um you know, just to kind of give some more information, right? So uh, so it's a show that's on Disney Plus about um, an Australian family of corgis um, named the, the Healer family. There's Bluey, Bingo, Bandit, and uh, Bandit's the father, and Chili's the, the mother. Um, and what I really like about this show is it really um, uh, models compassionate and healthy portrayals of family interactions um, among flawed well, corgis. Um, <laughs> um, and and I also uh, fully recognize um, that I 100% have a crush on um, on Bluey's dad, Bandit. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Time out. Uh oh. No, we have we have to we have to put this break into this particular episode. So for everybody that's interested in this topic, just please hold on. Um, Because we cannot drop something like that, Edward, in this episode and then not discuss that. Because you are not alone. There is an entire, like, dedicated (laughs) thing online to people sexualizing Bandit. Like, in very specific ways. Um, Like, people Mm want to do things with Bandit to Bandit, have Bandit do things, like... (laughs) The internet is for porn, and and Bluey has Roll not 42. escaped that. <laughs> yep. Very, very, very true. That is, that's, like, like, yeah. Um, yeah. Rule, rule thirty four highly 34, exists. 34. You cannot a, 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 a avoid it by any means in the imagination. Um, yes. So you are not alone in this. Um, you might want to talk yeah, to somebody imagine. about that. Uh, <laughs> It's, I mean, and the way that I think about that is, you know, obviously, I mean, I am somebody who loves daddies, right? So, like, the the fact, and I have historically found fathers on sitcoms, on TV shows, on in movies, um, you know, rather attractive, and that's very appealing to me. Uh, so this is this is not surprising, but it's good to know that, like. I'm hella not alone in this. Um, <laughs> and it's and it's not um, and it's not unique that I am uh, crushing over an anthropomorphic uh, dog like creature because my first ever crush was Disney's Robin Hood. Oh. Um, so oh, yeah, 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 very, yeah. very much right up the line for me. I mean, to be uh, fair, <clears throat> I was more in line with uh, Little John, but oh, I mean him too, but yeah. Both of them. Both of them. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, get Disney Plus and watch the Disney's Robin Hood. Oh my God, it's so good. It is so very good. I could quote. So I could quote that movie inside and out. Aha! Uh-huh. Aha! Uh-huh. Huh? Um, I love it. Um, and and so, no, that uh, wasn't oh. that wasn't an anthropomorphic character uh, uh, having an orgasm. That was, in fact, Prince Prince John making a joke and laughing. Yeah, laughing. That was his laugh. Um, so, I, if I were to postulate, um, and I, I, I did some some looking around, uh, that a lot, you know, besides sexualization, that a lot of people really um, appreciate uh, Bandit. Uh, because he's very present um, in the lives of um, of Bluey and Bingo, and uh, what uh, what Gary was talking about that this can be really appealing for people who may long for um, a dad that is um, or was present, caring, understanding, and compassionate of their mm-hmm. needs growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I- um, David, what were you gonna say? I just, I, I think that's uh, sometimes a a major like aspect of like queer culture is having those um, 
family members maybe in your past that did not accept you or you had that those feelings of not being accepted so finding a loving accepting their father figure or even in this case the you know entire family is something that i think relates to you know queer children or queer adults essentially like seeing a um loving family that you know is um there is very 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 you know fun to see yeah and you know like you know while bluey is a, is a good example like i think that we can all name um a laundry list of like possibly like sitcoms or um or other tv families that we really could identify growing up with um where we kind of saw that that we might not have been getting at home like i don't know why but the one that's coming up for me right now is full house right yeah that's the one that was like that was one family matters was another one that came to mind all of a sudden for me um uh home improvement if we're going late, late like mid early 90s yeah I mean, you could say that that home improvement did have a little bit of toxic ma- masculinity, but it was making fun of them. In a sense, yeah. 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 They sure. weren't perfect. <laughs> None of those were perfect. And also, like, they were not queer, right? So, like, um, you know, even when we are talking about Bluey, right, it's not necessarily queer-coded or it's not uh-huh. – um, uh, that isn't an aspect of it, but we can uh, obviously. <laughs> I mean, people have, yes. <laughs> people have, um, and they're going to, right? Just like we have been doing for for years and years and years. Um, so that's you know that's nothing new. Um, so you know, so like I said, so this is something that um, applies to everybody, right? Like if you go, if you look up Bluey Inner Child. You're going to see a lot of articles um, that talk about this relationship between this show and this concept. Um, so it is um, it is universal, it seems, uh, for a lot of people with this concept. Um, so let's talk about, like, Querios, right? So um, when, uh, you know, how, you know, the, the concept of healing your queer inner child... And why I think it's it's important for us to talk about that is it's different, right? Um, it's different for us kind of growing up um, because I think of um, Alexander Leon's quote on queer authenticity, um, which I've talked about on this uh, on this uh, show before. But you know, he says that queer people don't grow up as themselves; we grow up playing a version of ourselves that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. Uh, The massive task of our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves that are truly us and which parts we've created to protect us. And like, facts, right? Get it, get it. (laughs) Totally 100% that. Well, I mean, that, that. What? Wow, that second half. Yeah. That second half yeah. is like the, the massive task of our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves that are truly us and which parts we created to protect us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chills. Do you have chills? I have chills. I yeah. just I do, I think about how like people don't un, don't know that's a thing mm-hmm. because they have been authentically themselves their whole life. So they don't understand the concept of living a duality of having like a repression of, of parts of you versus not. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very true. I think I will, I mean, I won't speak for all of us, but I think a lot of us came out later in life, maybe like post high school, maybe even post college or during college. And you do realize you spent a lot of your life not living authentically. And I mean, all praise to those now who can, um, 
you know, for the most part, I know we're still dealing with issues here and there, but like the idea that, you know, this kind of this, what this quote kind of really hits home is like, you don't really think about it until you have to think about it. You, some of your um, um, reactions to things were probably due to the um, parts of yourself that you hid um, and reacted, you know, acted upon to not acted upon to keep yourself from harm. Right. Well, I mean, when, when you grow up in the concept of fear for your personal safety, Mm -hmm. that, that is a thing that you don't probably really recognize, or if you do, you don't understand the impacts of that and how, I don't know how accurate this is, but I feel like that's trauma inducing and has lifelong effects because Mm -hmm. you live in a heightened state of awareness. And this is something I've been seeing a bunch of because of the field of work that I do. It, it relates to the like social determinants of health concepts. And one of the key things is like, if you were kind of always hyper aware of your surroundings and what's happening, because you have a fear that because of the color of your skin, because of how you present yourself in the world, because somebody might, you know, want to harm you, like that does things to you, not only psychologically, but also physiologically, because you are like in an, in a heightened state. Mm-hmm. And so like you have hormones that are busy, like doing unintentional long-term, uh, I don't know if I want to say the word damage, but like it creates problems because you are in a stressed physical state all the time. And you don't realize that like that can be contributing factors later on as to like why you have high blood pressure or you have anxiety or Mm -hmm. you are tense or like, you know, Mm -hmm. why you create coping mechanisms in your life for dealing with things because you don't know what it's like to not be anxious. Yes, neurobiological systems. (laughs) No, absolutely. I mean, and you know, one of one of the things that I geek out all the time about is how you know stress has this like you know potentially negative relationship with our with our health. Um, and you know, think about um, what I was talking about before about uh, like attachment, right? That like you know because of what happens to us as kids, that that can have a um, that there's a direct connection between what happened to us as kids and how we behave as adults. Uh-huh. Um, so, like, this is why this work is really important because um, you know when you could be on a job interview, right? Um, when you are 44 years old, right, and somebody asks you a question and it triggers this memory from when you were 13 in the locker room. Um, whatever, and you're having a physiological response because your 13-year-old self is right there, not your 44-year-old self, your 13-year-old self, and mm-hmm. is having a really hard time. And as, um, and you know, when we were that third, we didn't have anybody. There was nobody there to, like, help us. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, we had to develop these things in order to take care of ourselves. And... Um, why this work is really important is we are giving ourselves the skills to like take care of that 13 year old self um, to tell him like or tell them that hey it's okay uh-huh. you're you're okay I got you right we're being the thing that we needed for ourselves when we were that 13 year old scared kid um, and I you know I mean I really resonate with that personally Um and I know that I'm hella not alone in this. Oh, no. Um, right. Uh, so this is why, um, you know, when we are trying to be authentically queer, right? Like, we have to figure out what that is for us and what that, what that 13-year-old version of us needed or wanted. And we get to be the ones to, like, do that um, and, like, celebrate that. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I mean I think I, I think there's anyways, there's a lot to unpack. 
<laughs> there's a there's a um i mean hell like the idea to me i was sitting here thinking like the like, idea of like trying to figure out those inner child like for lack of a better phrase traumas and those responses that we've made I, I that again the quote like hitting that hit a lot like home for me because I'm thinking about like all the things you used to do and up until for me recently still did you know to keep myself safe um not just out of concern of physical harm but um mental psychological you know harm um you know I'll so I'll, I'll let's throw this on the table. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, um, I'm going home for Thanksgiving um, this year um, as a married man to my husband, um, who, for some of my family, probably didn't. I mean, they knew no offense, but like, <laughs> but but like, Girl, probably were not been confirmed. I know. <laughs> but nothing has been confirmed. Like nothing was ever confirmed. Um, mm-hmm. It's up on Facebook. You, you, if you don't know, like you're blind and deaf and whatever. But anyway, but the the I I have a feeling, and this is me thinking out loud. I don't know if it'll actually be the truth. I have a feeling conversations are going to be had because there are members of my family that I did not invite to my wedding, and the main reason I didn't invite them was I did not want to deal either with them not coming are them real like dealing with their baggage and shit to Mm. actually attend i did not want to put them through that but i more than likely because this is our family gathering um we'll have i have a feeling there's going to be conversations but it will probably be a little hurt that I didn't invite them. And I'm going to, I may have to be, get out of some of my coping mechanisms, trying to please them and be like, you weren't invited. Well, <laughs> that's not kind of negative. You were invited because I kind of didn't want to deal with this. <laughs> I didn't want to deal with your, you potentially ruining my day. Okay. Fair. Uh-oh. No, I think that's fair. I mean, <laughs> there's a part of me that feels like if if I have a special event in my life and a person is not invited and they want to, like, engage in a conversation about that, we're welcome to engage in that conversation. But the key thing is I – if I know them, depending on their personality, I might be inclined to say, do you want to have this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because because this is about to be difficult potentially for for one of us or both of us, mm-hmm. and it's just and I feel like for me that's what I would do. I'm not telling you to do this, David, but I'm like that's what I would do because I'm like because this this is the closest thing to you are going to get out of me. And to put it a different cultural reference, this is me taking my earrings off, girl. <laughs> like <laughs> like. You want to go there? We we could go there. We can go but there. like, I'm just gonna give you the option to be like, do you want to have this conversation? Because because I think sometimes people don't realize what they say, especially they don't think about the environment that they're in, right. and the fact that it's a family gathering, and like you know, there's you know, hey, pro, there's there's a big dead bird on the table or a ham or whatever y'all are gonna have like you know, and carbs, 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 you know, and like you know, if it's a if it's anything like a classic American meal, like yeah. that's where it's like you know, this is this is a coming together of people in a camaraderie to have you know a good time together mm-hmm. and like you engaging in wanting to have this conversation doesn't feel that it's honoring that mm-hmm. so maybe we can wait until after the pecan pie and we can do that like in a different room or outside because if if you want if you want if you want me to cut your throat and like do a bloodbath across the the thanksgiving table we could do that but maybe not anyways no, no, I just totally I had this imaginative thing of a conversation for David, but anyways. No, I get what you mean. Because, um, again, uh, I know I've talked about this on the show. Um, years ago, I decided to stop, like, 
filtering, for lack of a better phrase, everything on Facebook. Like, I, I chose not to um, let certain things and certain people like I was always worried like certain people would find stuff out particularly family particularly family and I just I decided to not worry about that and if they had a question or if they had a comment or if they had a concern like they would say something and no one did so you know what if you if if you didn't if you didn't know by now you'd know by now and um and now having had the wedding and having it official it i i now feel yeah i'm going to say it, empowered to give no fucks um like yeah. if you had a problem with it if you had a problem with it that's your problem and and Damon, I, uh, I would say, like, as sorry, Ed, this is uh, as a part of this very topic today. I think that's a part of your own healing, like of you growing up in the family that you did in the environment that you did. Um, you've talked about it before about how you know spirituality and religion was a big piece of that, and it had effects on your life. And I think you know, as a person who is a full grown adult and has like worked on themselves, you have every right to turn around and be like, uh, I do what I want to say, what I want, and that's that. And this is my husband. Yeah. Well, right. he won't be there, but that's a, that's a different thing. Like that's oh. we 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 we've always done, and that's we may in the future do how hol- like those holidays together. But usually Thanksgiving is one that we've always done separately. Mm-hmm. That may change now that we're married. Who knows? We're going to give this year well, separate and figure it out. Look at you being an adult yeah, think- in America, trying to figure out how to yeah. balance two families. That's a weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a weird thing. Like my my um, brother got married in 2018, and he and his wife they alternate. Mm-hmm. They go, they do her family one year, they do his family the next, all that. So we'll see. Anyway, moving on. That's a separate conversation. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think well, it's I mean, important I mean, how Ed's like quote from Alexander Leon like prompted all of this discussion about the very things that you know. I think it's totally relevant that, you know, we we are having this reaction to the concept of we have things about ourselves we want to address and mm-hmm. and recognize that, like, it will benefit us by looking at things and determining how that's impacted us and how we'd like to change that for the future. Yeah, like, I mean, I think for, for me, right, that, like, you know, especially the family um, – context that growing up I always felt I had to be very defensive and I always had to be on guard um, mm-hmm. uh, and like that I was on I was like put on task for something um, and you know what my process is now is if I'm being if I'm responding to my inner child right like I think what my inner child needs or wants is just to be a part of um Mm -hmm. just to like have fun um and uh you know and with that i have to be i have to recognize when i'm noticing that i'm getting defensive or i'm feeling on guard right and to realize that like i don't have to do that anymore right Mm. like that isn't that isn't something that i i don't need it anymore Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I can just, I can, cause you know, a lot of that is my reaction to like other people's shit and other people's like problems. And I can just remember, oh, this is their problem. (laughs) Oh, this is, this is about them. This isn't about me. And I can, I can now see them compassionately, um, and go, oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then and then you know continue eating my pumpkin pie um and say thank you right like hey you know thank you for um you know thank you for saying that uh you know and however you want to say that and you know move on it's um, interesting ed that you say that because i just <laughs> uh communicated with a co-worker this past week about that i think it's parallel there's someone that we work with that tends to be and some have interpreted as dramatic, um, that they act out, so to speak. Um, and a bunch of us have been like, 
worn down <laughs> by the experience mm -hmm. of these things. And we were having a conversation recently about how one particular behavior changed because someone told them to their face, like, you do that all the time. And the person was like, what? What are you talking about? Like, they acted like they had, well, acted is the wrong word. Their response was that they did not know that that was a thing. And come to find out there was a slightly, you know, a little bit of engagement. Two different people came and approached them about in two different ways about this thing. And I had commented that I noticed that they don't do that anymore. And I thought that was a very interesting, like, turnaround. And anyways, they, a new behavior was exhibited now recently. And this person said to me, who we'd had this other conversation about the third party, this person said to me, why did they insert themselves into the conversation when it when it didn't when they like weren't invited? Um, and the thing was, we were in a hallway, so it's not like it was in an office privately. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a somewhat public area. And my response was sometimes people in, inject themselves because they desire to be valued and they find value in being involved mm -hmm. and value by being involved means that they are accepted and loved yeah and i said this to a person who i know is very religious and i was hoping that they would take that from that <laughs> standpoint of of remembering that i don't know their church but i'm pretty sure as a generality of christian concepts you love them despite them like, meaning, like, you accept them as they are, do not judge them, and even if they annoy the shit out of you, you still, like, you know, <laughs> attempt to, you know, welcome them or treat them, you know. And so it was an interesting comment, uh, you know, because that just is the first thing that came to me <laughs> was um, that, like, I've, I've been saying this for probably at least a decade, if not two decades now to people when they when they are very frustrated by something and they're like you know why this or that or whatever and i'm like remember this is what we're all doing as a human experience we are constantly seeking validation mm -hmm. affirmation acceptance and connection right we want to be a part of not not on the outside apart of. from right yeah. and so i you know i think a lot of people's behaviors come from that um, you know, and I've broken that down sometimes with some of my coworkers and I've said, think about it. Like, you know, we impulsively do things and we tend to do them because of what? Because of fear, because of, anxiety, mm -hmm. because of you know, these things that we're not worthy, that we don't have value, that we're not accepted, we're not a part of, like all of it kind of keeps rooting around to that. Um, and so I think that that's absolutely, a, you know, a piece of this as you, as you were just saying, anyways. Um, uh, no, yeah, abs and what was the other thing I was going to say regarding that? Um, that I don't remember. Well, okay, so sorry, I don't know. Um, so the other thing that that the first part of this quote, right? That like we didn't grow up as ourselves, we grew up playing a version of ourselves, a sacrifice of authenticity. Okay, so. I think another part of healing the queer inner child is doing the things that we did not feel like we had the um, permission to do growing up, like that were taboo or they were, um, they, they weren't against the gender norms. Um, they didn't, they didn't mm. um, fit the, the traditional masculine roles that we were playing. And um, uh, I have, so my own personal example of this that I think of is um, there were a lot of things that um, I uh, did that were not, that were left of masculinity, <laughs> as, I like, <laughs> as I like to say, uh, like theater. And I love musical theater and, and all these things. And I was totally fine with that growing up. But when I went to, and, you know, it also created distance for me and a lot of the kids in school because right. there wasn't really anybody who liked that. But when I went to high school, I just wanted to be liked. And so I joined the soccer team. And um, I remember that there was this guy who I was talking to um, and he was uh, saying, he was asking if I liked Metallica and I didn't even know who Metallica was. And, and I said, I don't, I don't know. And he was like, oh, well, I'll make you a tape. Um, so he made me a tape of uh, Metallica's Black Album. 
with like some other songs um, in there. And, you know, I, I liked it. Um, I genuinely liked it. Um, but I, I feel like I liked it because I wanted to fit in. Um, mm. And, um, and that like, there wasn't really anybody there who liked musical theater on the team. Um, so, you know, I was, I was doing what I needed to do in order to, um, to not be humiliated or, um, or, you know, uh, prejudice against. Um, mm -hmm. And that there are many other <laughs> examples of that for me, where I look through my music catalog and I'm like, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. That's that's not me. Mm. That's that's somebody else. That was me trying to um, Im impress somebody or um, or like somebody. So when I asked me, is this really me? No. And I have an entire playlist on Spotify that is just music. That is me um, that I have put my name on as something authentic to me. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, I know I did a lot of shit that I didn't want to do that you do because you want to fit in, you want to belong, you want to hide, as it were. Um, I played a lot of, like, tackle football as a little kid. I hate football. I, I mean, let me, get, let me rephrase. I like football players. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I don't like football in and of itself. Eh, whatever. I mean, yes, the tackling and running around, but like I, I'm remembering playing football with like the neighborhood kids when I was younger, um, and only doing it so I wouldn't be seen as the sensitive boy that I was. You know, um, I played with the girls. That's what I remember. Like I, I, I did. I, that was me. Like, I love doing that. I love, like, um, <laughs> cartwheel contests and, and little, like, hand clap games and all that stuff. And I was more, like, my sister um, was three years younger than me. So we knew, you know, we were always together. And my brothers were seven, seven years older than me. I think I've discussed this before. So by the time I'm, you know, born or getting to their, like, milestones I, they've already moved on like the things that they would enjoy they're now like when i'm seven they're 14 like that they're they're moving on to other things so they wouldn't like the things or be able to enjoy the things that i as a seven-year-old kid would really be into because they've already moved past it um but like the neighborhood kids and all that stuff you had kids of all ages in my neighborhood and that football, I hate it so much. <laughs> like, like sitting here now, I'm like, yeah, nope, never liked it. I remember crying. Same. Yeah. So I know I'd never, I did basketball for my church because that's what you were supposed to do. Like, it wasn't that I wanted to, it was that's what you're supposed to do. So I, I again, I didn't like, I didn't like sports. I will own that. I did not like sports. So, but I did it because I, that's what you were kind of told to do. And it also hid any like sensitivities that you would have. Um, yeah, I, I had a thought about, um, so you know the song, What's Going On, right? Yeah. Is that, that's what it's called, okay. Um, I remember freshman year of high school, around that same time, right? Listening to Metallica's Black Album. Um, <laughs> going to my first pep rally ever in my entire, you know, I went to a little small Catholic school and I, I jumped up to like a little larger Catholic school. So I went to my very first pep rally and I saw cheerleaders and I was like, what are they doing? Look at them dance to this music. Like I want more of that. I, that's what I want. Right. And, um, and like, you know, I was I, I and I was I was driving to my office thinking about this, and I was like, imagining in my head the conversation that I would have had with my parents, like, you know, as my inner child, right? Like to say, hey, I really saw this thing that I really liked. I don't necessarily want to be a cheerleader, but like, 
I kind of want to do that dance and I kind of want to, um, I want to, I want to, that was awesome. Right. And I, and I feel like, and I'm really grateful for my parents because I think my dad saw that in me and was able to be like, Hey, I think theater would be really good for you. <laughs> would be, I think that you should audition for this. And he was right. And that was what, you know, what I really needed. So, yeah. you know, sometimes we can have like super supportive parents growing up, but we're the person who's in the way of that, right? Because mm-hmm. we're the ones who like feel like we have to develop these coping strategies in order to protect ourselves. So that's why, and like sometimes we don't hear that from the people who are screaming it. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, do these things that will be helpful. Yep. So sometimes we really need to parent ourselves and give ourselves the things that we may have not have been ready to hear growing up. Yeah. Yep. 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 Hmm. We did theater for church too. That's where, and my, I was fortunate enough to have a father that was charismatic and enjoyed theater and was a good actor. So he did a lot of um, that kind of stuff. So I got involved through my dad in theater at a young age, which led to doing like small things in church plays, um, which led to obviously a now love for theater. That was the good thing. There was a, there was a way to not hide, but enjoy it without um, it being seen as being too, like, queer or, you know, what have you, because it was being done in the concept, again, it was being done in the concept of, like, church and theater. Theater was being done in the concept of, under the concept of a church. So it was okay to be on stage, you know, playing a role. And I'm not talking just, like, the, the like... Um, nativity plays or anything like that. We actually did, now these are written by like probably church like people, like plays, but we did these kind of plays. And I remember, yeah, it was a great opportunity. And again, it's what fostered a a long-term, hence theater cub, um, long-term love of theater. So yay for that, for having, thank heavens I had it, because I don't think, Again, you realize it um, as we've been kind of talking about it. Like, yeah, if if I hadn't had that, I don't know what I would have done. Um, It wasn't until um, middle school that the um, smart button button was pushed and I could do things like quick recall and um, National Honor Society and stuff like that, where I could do like smart things. Um, and smart, smart became my cover. Intelligent things became my cover because that's where because smart leads to uh, opportunity. Opportunity, which leads to getting the fuck out of where you are, which had its own yeah. in a word. But like the the um, the the big things, like having the theater really helped because I did. I even did theater in high school. That really was wonderful. So yay for that. Um, oh, that sounds like you had a very kind of, uh, there, the, there are a lot of similarities there in, in my child because my dad was definitely my, my gateway into, into that. And I don't know, I sometimes, like my family is like, oh, dad didn't know and dad would have, and I'm like, oh, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> he, he like pushed me onto that stage. He, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. I don't think, I don't want to say... I don't want to say it was because dad knew. I want to say it's because um, it was something that we could do together, that he could do, and yeah. maybe it gave him his excuse to do it. Um, uh, yeah, I won't, we won't, but let's not open that door. <laughs> okay. Let's keep it where it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I mean, I think that, you know, we're talking about just like those experiences, but there are a lot of things that we didn't do as a kid that we probably could have done more of if we were given, if we gave ourselves or if we had support to do certain things. And, um, you know, so to tie this back to like, you know, inner child's work, some of the the things that I will have some clients do um, that I have done myself, right, is to um, 
like write letters to um, a younger version of myself um, or just, you know, have a conver- imagine having a conversation with a younger version of yourself um, uh, and then playing, right? Like, so engaging in things that were, um, that are playful, creative and spontaneous. Um, those are all things that, that we can do. So, you know, um, some things that I have personally done that have been very, very helpful for me um, was for my 40th birthday. You know, I quasi identify as a Disney adult, um, but going to Disney World for the first time, I would, I would like daydream about going to Disney growing up. Um, and the, the, we went to Disney when I was like five or six, and I just loved it. So I never gave myself the opportunity to go back as, as, you know, um, uh, older child or as an adult. So for my 40th birthday, I decided to go and it was like, it is. And, and, you know, I've been to Disneyland since, and it's, it's always just been the, the perfect way that I can connect with my inner child and I can do what little Edward wants to do, right? Like to go to a character breakfast. Um, if, oh my God, what, what an amazing thing and a gift that you can give yourself is just to go to a character breakfast. Holy hell. <laughs> um, but the one thing that will always stick out of my mind is the first time I heard the happily ever after um, firework show, um, I was smack dab in the middle of like my PhD process and oh, I like get emotionally been thinking about it. But like just the narrative of that show was very um, healing and it was very much like things that I wanted my inner child needed to hear um, from anybody, not just parents, but just somebody to say that, you know, as you go on this journey, right, it's going to be hard, um, but it's going to be worth it. And then have its place with all these Disney quotes and songs that are like, like my inner child just grabs onto, Um, you know, that's the work that I do. And, you know, um, and so I also never, I never went to any concerts growing up. Um, that was one thing that like my parents didn't do. Um, they took me to a couple Broadway shows though. So I'll give them that, but I never went to a concert. Um, so I would, um, I love to take myself to concerts. Like I have started to like go to concerts by myself and do things by myself that is a good way to parent yourself, Um, taking yourself to dinner, taking yourself to the movies, go to Disneyland by yourself, right? Go to Palm (laughs) Springs by yourself. Just so much like freedom that I've given my, that I'm giving myself that I never had. I never allowed myself the experience of having Uh um, because I was always just scared. Um, So, you know, these are definitely ways that I, I myself, um, practice that and I'm kind of wondering for for you all right what are some things that you do or you want to start doing that you think would be really helpful for you to kind of interact with your inner child <laughs> don't all talk at once I'm waiting I'm... I know I mean I I think I've been doing a little bit of it like for example, this year I've gone to two concerts. Nice. I haven't been to concerts and I don't even remember when. And I think part of it was just because I was like, eh, if I get to it, I get to it. If I don't, I don't. Uh-huh. But like, I really enjoyed going. And it's ironic because two of my very best friends, they go all the damn time. <laughs> like, like, like almost, and it isn't their intention, but almost obnoxiously, like it's just their thing. And I appreciate that about them. And I don't really think much about it. In fact, although that's true, the last time I went to a concert before this year was with them years ago. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, I realized it was like, wow, this, this is a thing that like you can do and you can enjoy. And um, recently, the most recent one I went to, there was a younger person that went with us. It was their very first concert. And it was interesting because the rest of us were all adults. And there was this whole like topic of conversation and this focus about how this is their very first concert. How cool is that? And blah, blah, blah. And of course, as you know, older individuals, we were reminiscing about what our first concert was. 
And I had to look up like the year that I went to my concert because I knew my concert was a part of an album tour. So and I knew who the artist was and all that. And I had to go back and like see when that was. And I was like, wow, like that was a formative experience because I talked about how when the artist came out on stage and started to perform, I became overwhelmed with emotion. Mm. And I just like bald and like was yep. in inconsolable and my father did not know what to do and could not figure out what was happening to me like he asked me several times if i was okay if i was upset and i kept saying yes i was okay and no i wasn't upset he couldn't figure out why i kept crying though like why i was just like and looking back on it now i was like i was overstimulated like i mm. I had never had an experience like that, had never been in, in a space with so many people at one time having a communal, like similar moment, uh, maybe not all having the exact same experience, but one of like, you know, um, and so it was a lot of things. It was elation. It was joy. It was happiness. It was like all this exuberance. It's just I was so young. I had I didn't have vocabulary. I didn't have ways to like express that. And so physically, my body was like, you know, just like overjoyed. And so I'm just like this child standing on a chair, just like sobbing. And my, <laughs> you know, my dad just didn't know what to do with that. Um, and not that he did anything, you know, wrong or, or needed to do something. Um, what he what he kind of just needed to do was to be there. Right. Um, in that moment but you know i had i had kind of talked about this at this concert and it was interesting to be like decades removed and to think back on that and how now i'm older and i'm at a concert and it's kind of a bucket list thing and i'm so i'm doing this and i'm like wow like this was this was an interesting juxtaposition like or comparative of like what i was like when i was younger and what i am versus now and how like I've always felt that the arts um, as an experience and music is a thing that I need in my life, but I keep taking actions or going past that divert me and, and like stray me away. And then I have moments where like a couple weeks ago I came into work and like I knew when I got into work, I was extra chipper, like I was a little more up and that's because I had been listening to music all morning. Like I listened to the uh -huh. music after I got out of bed and when I was in the shower and it was like, there was an artist with a new album. And so I was like, listen to the music and I was really getting into it. And, um, I made a comment to somebody at work. I was like, uh, cause I think they kind of said something along the lines of like, I was very energetic or whatever. And I was like, yeah, because I forget what music is in my life. Like music is important, mm. but I keep, I keep disconnecting from it. Like I don't make it a constant until I'm having a time where I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm like, you know, grumpy or moody or just like depressed or something or anxious. And then I'm like, right, I need to remember to engage in that because that's a thing that works for me. Um, for other people, it could be like exercise or working out or being creative and making something or whatever that is. Um, and so then I had to, as a sidebar, I'll talk about it another week, uh, next week's episode, but I, I had to, I didn't have to, well, it's a long story. Anyways, I presented for work to all of my coworkers and it was an, and it was an interactive activity. It was a lot of things. And so like, I listened to a lot of music that morning because I was like, like, it was one of those, like, you know what, baby, you got to buckle down. You got to be you got to be on it and you got to bring it together and the only way i knew that was going to work for me is if i listen to music so wow. i was listening i was listening to upbeat stuff i was listening to stuff that's my favorite songs like some of my like favorite artists and then i like and i have <laughs> this is so stupid um it's so stupid but like i have a downloaded album from years ago which is like uh it's not the original artist but it's like you know close of artists and it's like the top 35 jock jams music like huh. you remember those albums that came out for yeah, the longest yeah. time and they were like you know um pump up the volume, up the volume. yeah it was man, like you know I, I think what, I what is some of those albums. what were the called name the, of those albums it was literally called jock jams no, 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 I know, but there was a there was a whole series. Now that's that, that's what I call oh. music. Oh, it's, now it's, it's, this. 
And it was like in that it was in that genre, but it's like these thirty five like da 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 you know like those like really kind of like you know pep bandy you know like halftime in between if you go to a big sporting event when they play these like things that like really kind of like get the crowd going. And so I was listening to that in the morning and then when I got, but it was funny because I was listening to all these songs and I was like, I need one of these for the activity. Like, cause everybody has to get up out of their seats and come up and do something. So I need some segue. And I was like, and I'm not doing silence. That's, that's not how I work. So I was like, I need some music. And finally I like ended up, um, believe it or not. And, and it's ironic because of our show, I did what's going on. And, and it was funny because someone said to me, they were like, nice song. And I was like, I know, right? Um, <laughs> and then it was funny because, like, so I had some music playing in the background while they were doing an activity. And um, I made a comment. They were like, they were like, oh, it's kind of fun to have music. And I was like, well, I really wanted to play the Beastie Boys, but I also didn't want to get in trouble. And <laughs> <laughs> it was really kind of funny because they were like, oh. And it just reminded me how, like, there was just a thing. Like when I was younger, especially in my teen years, man, music was a constant, mm -hmm. which is weird to say because I'm like, well, let's see. You were in band. You were in choir. <laughs> like you did that. I went to college for music, but my my path diverted. It went in a different direction. And so I like uh -huh. I think that's something that's been of late. I've been reconnecting with and saying to myself, like, oh, it's OK. Like you can do that thing. Like I used to love going to a bar and dancing to music and and all that stuff. And I don't know, like for Damn. some reason I shifted anyways yeah well That's i it. wanted to um i just kind of wanted to rewind a little bit because you brought up a really cool point that i wanted to like um take a snapshot of like when you were talking about being at that concert um i i fully believe and like i said this before that every single version of ourselves is existing within ourselves at every single moment right so like um you know whatever version of you that was that that um at that concert, right, with your dad having that, like, overwhelming experience, right, was the same version of you who is, like, at that concert, um, you know, with you, like, recently. And I really like, like, in those moments to, like, acknowledge that and to, like, just call that out, right? Like, and to even, you know, be like, you know, I'm right here, buddy, right? Um, I got you, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they're having the time of their fucking life and um and that deserves to be celebrated right um and i just think it's cool to like think about um that reparenting experience of like you know you know your dad was like i don't know what to do <laughs> i don't know what to do and like that's an interesting comfort and solutions right you just wanted to be acknowledged and comforted in that moment and that's what we can do, right? Like, and I literally do this. Like, I put my hands, oh, you know, over my heart, and you know, and I'm like, I'm right here, right? I got you, right? Oh, it totes emotion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's a real. I I think that this is one of the coolest things that us as queer people can do is to show up for ourselves. Um, as adults for that kid who really needed us when we were 13 and felt really hella alone. Uh -huh. That's fair. And misunderstood. I mean, yeah. I mean, how much, how much of your life are you really clicking? And by clicking, I mean like everything is lining up. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't think that happens for a lot of us, no matter what. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't care what you see yourself as or how you portray yourself in the world or what your, what your levels of authenticity are or any of that kind of stuff. I just think like, it's, it's about like, I don't know, being in the groove yeah. of, of that. And I think when that's not happening is, is why we struggle because we get anxious and we're kind of out of sorts and things aren't, you know, going as we would think or hope or whatever that may be. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting Ed, that you you talked about that. Um, yeah, yeah, um, and I have uh, like to the whole authentic music thing. I have a I like I said I have a whole playlist that is music that is mine uh -huh. um, that isn't anybody else's, um, and whether it's, you know a lot of music are things that people introduced us to, right? Um, so, but like. I have absorbed that as like part of my uh -huh. identity. And those are in those moments, 
that that is the music I need to listen to um, because it really connects me with me. And and also a lot of them are they're kind of like wormholes to a past version of myself. I was really super happy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like when I hear um, anything from Kylie Minogue's debut album or Madonna's Immaculate Collection or, oh my God, put on Debbie Gibson, um, Electric Youth, I will, I will lose my mind. Go back in time. Yeah. I or like Les Mis, if, you, if you're, if we're listening to Les Mis, I, yeah, I just think about like the, the 12 year old me sitting in a Broadway theater for the very first time hearing those first car, bum, 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 <laughs> and like yeah. just being overwhelmed um, and hyper emotional of this thing that I have idealized for so long um, mm-hmm. that it's still like anytime I hear that I'm still that same 12 year old kid. Yep. I was thinking, I'm sitting here trying to think, like, I'm I'm remembering, I'm having a memory of, and it had to have been my first ever, like, big theater show, and it's a, the smallest fragment of a memory, uh, but I know it was me and my family, um, and I believe it was Porgy and Bess, believe, mm. I don't, again, I cannot, confirm it because it feels so long ago like 30 ish years ago I had to have been less than 10 wow 10 or less I should say I feel um and it, and it's one of my first I like I it's like I'll close my eyes and I get the feeling I'm getting like sitting in like an ant like a theater like up in like balcony seats probably looking down on a, on a production and um the only reason i think it's porgy and best is because i've listened to some of the songs from the, like recordings of it and it sounds familiar it may not have been it at all just putting it out okay. there but that's what's like triggering the memory for me so I'm hoping that's what it is um, but I think that was again like one of those moments where it caught my first eye and I think for me the love of theater has always been that um, role playing and being on stage and c- able to create and develop a new persona for lack of, for lack of a better phrase and that just has always been intriguing to me um so yeah i'm i'm appreciative of the father that wanted to do theater i'm appreciative of the opportunities that i had because i think theater is and will always be a part of my life it's something that i when you were talking about things that are authentically you that theater is authentically me that is something i know i have always enjoyed and loved not because of something or some other response to something else and it yeah. wasn't the bad th- the good things and this is me being um wonderful is it was one of the things that i could enjoy no matter where i was so even in like high school doing theater wasn't seen as like a negative it wasn't like oh you're you know you're not like the big sports guys but it wasn't like theater nerd kind of like fuck you kind of thing it was very much okay which seems weird when you think about it now but that was sort of where i got my appreciation for because it was something where i could enjoy it without enjoy without consequence Mm -hmm. that's what it is i could enjoy it without consequence because there wasn't a negative side to it and there had never been Almost, le- almost, almost like, yeah. What Alexander Leon is saying that, like, that was something that you developed that you didn't have to put up those defenses or those walls in order to protect yourself. You mm-hmm. could, you felt very authentic in that experience, and it was protected for you. Like, 
I know that growing up, like, oh, always like the most popular, uh, like football kids were in th- were did the shows, mm-hmm. and like our class president was always in the show. So right. like it was always something. It never felt like it was an attack, or it never felt like it felt like it was something that was celebrated. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Indeed. Uh huh. Look at us healing our inner children. <laughs> Anyway, hmm. um, so you know, I think <laughs> to, <laughs> to kind I of just, wrap this. What I saw the watching cartoons. I will. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh uh, no. Um. Uh. And you know, so you know, other things that I put here are playing games, right? Um. I know that a lot of um. You know, a lot of people love to play D and D and. Um, like other kind of games that really connects them to their, um, you know, to their inner child. And I think that's definitely a part of it. Um, and, um, you know, the, like the other thing that I said was that, you know, these are things that we can, you know, ju- we can do, right? But if you want to make this a, um, like a really deeper experience, um, you know, I, I would recommend talking to a therapist, right? Um because they can really help guide you, right? Like, it's really important to me, especially with my therapy practice, that I am like your, I am like your, your travel guide. Um, and it's a pleasure that I get to help people along on their journeys. Um, and that it's cool to have somebody help us with that. Um, and, you know, help us see things that we may not be able to see. Um so, you know, definitely being able to look at the map um, and uncover parts of it that we may even be scared to look at. Yeah. Or not ready to look at. Mm-hmm. That part. That part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, um, I think, I think this is a, this is a great process and I really appreciate us um, talking about that. And also that, the, that this topic is called this, right? Um because when we think of relationships, we usually think of relationships with other people. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I, our relationship with ourselves is probably the most important relationship that we can develop so that we can have um, really awesome relationships with other people. Agreed. Agreed. Fair. Um, so, yeah, if... Uh, like I said before, if anybody wants to reach out to me, if you have thoughts on this or um, if you think that this is something that you might want to do, right, and you maybe want some help in figuring out how to start that process, let me know and um, I can help point you in the right direction. I was just thinking <laughs> this past weekend was the EU fan fest for Final Fantasy 14 and the creator of the original Final Fantasy game was participating and they were playing mm. the fan fest they were playing a video game mm. even even the director likes playing is playing video games and they're like 50 60 years old why would kind of hope so well like it would it would to me that would that would be strange like uh, is it possible sure but that would that's almost like saying um this person is a chef but they don't like to eat yeah but we're talking about like the creator of the first game didn't create anything for final fantasy 14 remember there's been 16 Right, right, right. I mean, that, that's yeah, fair. Right? I, I see what you're saying. But and he there's likes a part of me playing this game, even though it's part of his franchise and such. And the and even those the they don't just play Final Fantasy Square Enix games. They also play. They've also been playing other games like Blizzard games and Bethesda games and just a whole bunch. And then you also see creators, creators. Like we were talking about D and D, we see 
creators who are yeah. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all playing games. Uh, Matthew mm-hmm. Lillard. Yeah. He has an entire company devoted to making a premium version of D&D because he loves playing D&D. Joe Mang- Mangiello, ah, however you pronounce his name, a uh, famous actor, also plays D&D. There's, and they're getting up there in age and they're still playing because uh, the, um, playing, playing, playing. So the, um, you just made me have a thought like that. Um, you know, when you were talking about like the creator of like Final Fantasy playing like Final Fantasy 14, right? Like, I also think that that really speaks to kind of like, I don't want to say the opposite of inner child, but like being willing to like, continue playing with your creations like 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 foresight right like that um like being able to see what you have created and look at how far that has gone and still engage with it even even though it is like far beyond like your involvement um, like still engaging with it, so I think that's I think that's really cool because I know that there's a lot of like um, um, like theorists or like who are just very stuck in their ways um, and they don't continue to play. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's not well. That has been one of the things. Play. Right. I yeah. mean, I think that's something that's been talked about in like a uh, private sector corporate culture for a long time is like how to have fun at the job that you have, which is a little ironic because there's also this this concept or this theory axiom, whatever you want to say that like you should enjoy the work that you do. Right. And and like, therefore, if it's something that you really enjoy, sometimes we say if you really love it, it's not work. Right. And part of that is because I think you find it fun. You you like get something out of it. Obviously, there's a feedback loop, but it's that it's one that fulfills you in some fashion. Right. Yeah. But it's still work. (laughs) Right. Like, I think that, you know, I like that that thought. Um, And I think it's like it goes both ways because I know that sometimes I love the like cool parts of therapy (laughs) right (laughs) i like i like when it feels great um i sometimes i don't i hate the paperwork um i hate the like a lot of the process because it's not fun right the productivity part of it is ugh. like right after this i have to do notes (laughs) i don't like that part exactly I don't know. You already put in extensive extensive notes. I think we're okay. No, I think he's I think he meant for his actual job he gets paid for, not for his time volunteering to be a co-host or, or as a guest on our podcast. Mm-hmm. He's made the funny. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, with that. Play ways Don't to contact play us. How are you connecting with your inner child? Play ways to tell us. You can do that by uh, commenting on our blog at cubsoutloud.com. Shoot us an email at cubsoutloud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 361 Seable Talk. That's 361 265 8255. Following us on Facebook, Twitter.com, and YouTube, where you can like, comment, and subscribe. You can find out, uh, also chat us up on our um, Telegram chat at bit.ly slash telegram dash col. If you want to know, want to interact with us in person while we're recording these shows, you can check us live. I find out when those are on our Google Calendar at bit.ly slash calendar dash col. You know, get various equipment, such as an apron or t shirt or a mug. Or a hat. Um, or a handy towel. Mm-hmm. 
all over in a Zazzle store at Zazzle.com slash it comes out loud. Some of those designs were designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. I have an idea for my next upgrade. Um, but, you know, that requires money. And Patreon can help with that. You can also send us a donation at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, you can find us all on all the podcasting platforms where you can rate us or review us there. The more you rate us or review us, the more up in the algorithm, the more people will find us. We appreciate that. That's how you can support us. Uh, it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon Audible. You can find me sometimes on the internet. At Box, at Box, Poppy, Box, Club, Box, something or other. Damon? <laughs> if you wish to get in touch with me, um, you can find me at theatercub 79 that's T-A-G-A-T-R-E-C-U-B-7-9. Um, most bear related sites are on Twitter. You can also find me as pup underscore umbra on, nope, I'm pup underscore umbra on Twitter. Shit. Fuck. <laughs> I'm not looking at the script. <laughs> I'm Theater Cup 7 on our most very related sites or Facebook. I'm Pup underscore Umbra on Twitter. I am Pup Umbra 79 on Blue Sky. All of those are not safe for work. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. Uh, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gary 73 and to our special guest, Dr. Edward Angelini Cook, if people would like to get in touch with you, how would they do so? Well, you can find me on Facebook as Edward AC. Um, my business uh, website is eactherapy.com. Um, I am on TikTok as Dr. Unica, or Dr. Unicub 79. Uh, my Instagram is Dr. Unicub underscore sex brain wizard. And if you want to connect with me on Twitter, um, my safe for work version is Eddie H. Cook. And my not safe for work is dr. Unicub after dark. Mm. And with that, take it on, everybody. Good night, everybody. Have a good one, y'all. Pasta la pasta. <laughs>